So our next session, uh, we have got a panel of tech developers here who are going to sort of introduce us individually to the products that they've developed, how they work, what the benefits are. Um, and, you know, this will really, you know, we've heard some of the challenges in our pharma session, and now we're going to meet the people that are stepping up to provide the solutions with support from AgriEpi, of course. Uh, there will be some videos on screen as well. There's no sound, but it will just help to give a bit of visual context to what our panelists are talking about. Um, so we've got here Howard Wu at Antibot, uh, Jack Rangham, Rangham is Director of Drone Ag at Skippy Scout, Jim Wilson is MD at Soil Essentials, and James Brown is at Polybell Farm. I'm just going to start with Howard if that's okay, I'll just take a, a seat. Um, so Howard, you're um, Chief Executive Officer at uh, Antobot, um, your company has actually been collaborating with Ian from the previous session um, on digitally mapping his vineyard, um, and you use in-field robots. What kind of information do they gather, and how can farmers use that practically? Sure, thank you, Anna. So uh, we develop the uh, uh, agriculture uh, robotics uh, technology uh, platform. And based on this platform, so we got a, a number of applications, like the infield robots, and one of those, we called it a, a crop scouting robot. Crop scouting robot, yes. okay. So we put it into the field, and uh, one, to map the field, to know where the plants being planted. And then with that, we are hopefully to help, for example, like Ian and other growers to map their whole field more efficiently and more accurately. So we get to know exactly where your, uh, each like a tree is or like a plant is. Uh, secondly, we developed the computer vision uh, technology, which when we go through the field, we can recognize the fruits in the field, for example, strawberries. And uh, then we can tell you what its ripeness level, and we can count how many strawberries in your field, and also work out the size of the strawberries. So with that, hopefully, we can tell the growers, if you come to do harvesting of your strawberries tomorrow, uh, how likely, I mean, how much weight of the good strawberries you will harvest. And also in three days or one week. So hopefully, with that information, the growers can make uh, more optimized decisions, how they schedule their labors, how they sign their contract with the supermarkets, how to supply the information into the downstream supply chain to make the whole system more efficient. Um, and thirdly, we also developed a, a field a logistics robot, which is to help the human pickers to transport the harvested fruits uh, into the uh, warehouse. Oh, kind of like a, the donkey mule robot that does all the fetching and carrying. Yes. Great. Yes. I think there is no way for the robot to really replace our humans. Our humans are so good in uh, intelligence, so, but we, we hope we can let the robot to do some uh, repetitive and less interesting jobs. Mm. And, and the back-breaking uh, work. Yeah, yeah. And the, those are like uh, hard work there. Yeah. Um, and our vision is uh, with the uh, platform, we want to really work with uh, Agri-EPI and all the growers, farmers, like yourself, to co-develop uh, all kinds of like applications you would like to have, which will make sense for your business, to make your operation more efficient, make the uh, whole like farming more sustainable. I think that's a sustainable word. Like, uh, there it is again. Yep. <laughs> and uh, hopefully it's like in three domains, not, not only environmentally sustainable, but uh, economically and uh, socially sustainable. Because overall, I think farming is still business. I think it's not right when we are buying our like gas from petrol station, which cost us nearly two pounds per liter. But when we buy our bread, which human eat, not a car eat, is like one pound per bag. Mm. So I think there's something we need to really help as together, so for the industry to make it really economically uh, sustainable as well. 
Can I just ask about mapping? So uh, this is going to come across a very ba a basic question, but I can imagine people thinking this, that everything you've said about a strawberry harvest, knowing when the strawberries are ready to pick, the level of ripeness, how many you've got, I totally get that. Knowing where the trees are on your farm, wouldn't I know that anyway? Uh, I don't know. This is a good <laughs> question to probably to the growers. I would uh, open this question to our growers and the farmers. Do you know where exactly your trees or plants are? Not exactly, but we can sort of see them. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I was like, because the way that farmers speak about their land, you know, f farmers are incredibly, you know, they'll have descriptions for individual hedges. It's like, they'll have weird names maybe. It's kind of like, oh, it's at the the top of turkey field next to the oak tree next to the something hedge. And so they're not, they're not kind of digital maps, but farmers have these kind of landscape maps in their head that have their own language around them, their own kind of, that have been passed down generations. Do you, do you recognize that, John, what I'm trying well, to? You no, know, because we have an airport near here, because it's Stansted Airport. And when we fly in and we come anywhere near the farm, I can just spot my farm, because the, the shapes that look so familiar. I can just see that's where they are. <laughs> so maybe it's about so, that, that matching up that kind of on-the-ground knowledge of I know every hedge, tree, and field yeah. with what a digital mapping, yes. what, what, how so would a digital map show? I can't describe the, the picture we created for one of our partner uh, strawberry farm. So they have a field with about like 20 polytalos, and within each polytalo, they have six rows of strawberries. So what we showed one picture to him, he thinks, wow. So what is, we showed their strawberry density at their individual level. Basically, the picture shows, if you think about each row of the strawberries, we have red, green dots to show, like in this row, how dense your strawberries are and what's their Rapidies. And we show that for each individual row in each individual polytalo and then for all 20 polytalos. Right. Okay. So that level of details yeah. okay. probably it's it's another layer. difficult to remember exactly <laughs> where my story from. But they're quite complementary of each other. Though that kind of human knowledge of, of a map in the human brain with, with yes. what that's digital, and they can work together. And the information uh, given to him is he look at the map. This polytalo since has more fruits than this one, and this row since has a bit more. Oh, what happened there? Is that some like nutrition not really being put pumped in there, or maybe of my polytalo the 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 sunlight and uh, it created a like, macro macro environment there, like the temperature, humidity impact on their like uh, production level. So that gives their all of this kind of information, yeah. uh, we, the, the robot is not, not intelligent. It cannot make any decisions by that. However, the growers, they can. They have like years of experience. When they look at that data, they got, oh, maybe this because like this row has bit less because they are like the edge of that polytalo. So the temperature needs to be cooler. So, mm. yeah. I understand. That's fascinating. And, and because you I think we'll stick with kind of vegetable production and we'll, we'll come over, over to you. We'll, we'll move on to drones and uh, soil in just a sec. But James Brown, I wonder if you could pick up off Howard there. Have you got a microphone up there? Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, so you run, you've got a large organic family farming business producing cereals, vegetables and livestock across three counties, Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire and South Yorkshire. So really sizable farming business. Um, I'm really interested. You've been using a robotic weeder uh, in the field. On what crop? Yeah, so um, Polybell is also a founder of Earth Rover. And the reason we started is that one of the big challenges of organic production, particularly veg and salad, is weeding. Um, and one of the real things is that it's either mechanical hose, and we wanted to try and come up with a solution that didn't disturb the soil, so we could look to build the organic matter in the soil. And also, we were mapping and discovering the damage that mechanical hoeing does. The other alternative is manual labor, which it's not a pleasant job. It's expensive, so um, about a thousand pounds a hectare to weed an organic veg crop. Mm -hmm. So what we've developed is an ultra lightweight autonomous platform that then kills weeds with um, concentrated light. 
So we concentrate lots of light bulbs onto the merry stem, about a millimeter across, of the plant, and take that merry stem from 15 degrees up to 80 degrees, which bursts the cells, you get eruptive boiling, and kills the weed. Uh, so no chemicals, there's a million tons of herbicide put into the environment every year. Goodness and that's one of our big bits. We want to make organic more accessible to more. Weeding is a, a huge problem with that. And as you can see, the video uh, on the right there is uh, also being able to operate autonomously at night. At the same time as weeding, we gather data. So you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, this is what the uh, vision is seeing. And on the right is the platform, the data platform, which it displays for the farmer. Um, one of the big beats there is, I I'm a boring accountant by training. Uh, when I came back to our family business, I asked the question, why do I buy 8 million broccoli seeds and sell 4 million broccoli heads? What actually happens? And why are you talking to me about yield as something we've grown, i.e. tons per hectare? What about yield in terms of the percentage of inputs that turned into outputs? And uh, I got some very dirty looks from around the farm. <laughs> but actually, this question of, I want to farm at the individual plant basis, and particularly in veg or salads, just to give you an example on organic broccoli, a plant is either, which produces a head which we sell is worth 80, 90p to me, one which I don't is worth nothing. So the advantage of thinking of that level, and that is where trying to improve that. And also from a food waste point of view, 25% of broccoli seeds end up being eaten. So we have a system, a full end-to-end -end system with 75% wastage. Goodness Therefore, we talked about, you know, why do I want to capture data? Why do I actually want to understand that plant, how it's growing? And the reason is that we need to produce more from the same amount of area, the same amount of input. That's the fundamental reason why we've developed this technology. Um, and uh, obviously working with the agri Epicenter, Centre, with Innovate UK and the European Space Agency, um, we've helped fund um, product as one, along with our investors. Um, and I think it's... We, we see we want more sustainable farming and we were trying to look at on our own farm what are the challenges mm. and how do we address them and where is that technology gap and a weed control was the first bit we've also got another project which we're doing with the agri heavy center which, as dave describes my giant hedgehog which is a selective broccoli harvester which is again using it so from the data we were able to gather we started looking at well my mechanical weeding was destroying five percent of my plants that actually Optimizing harvest is the big win, hence why we've then taken this information we've learned to then move on to next, the next generation of products. Gosh. And you, you, you said light, not lasers. We're not talking about lasers here. We're talking about what's the difference between light and laser? Uh, okay, uh, luckily I'm not the CTO, otherwise you get a very geeky answer. Uh, <laughs> basically, a laser is a collimated beam of light. Our concentrated is lots of beams of light that come together in a single focal point, which then diverge after that focal point, which means that they won't blind or burn you. Wow. Gosh. And, and uh, yeah, producing broccoli organically has got to be one of the hardest jobs in farming. I, I, I've spoken to many brassica growers who say, good luck doing this organically. I've tried to grow broccoli myself. It's absolutely really hard to do. Well, add in, we had on the farm 40.1 degrees centigrade, then 120 mils of rain. That was this summer's joys of farming. But what the interesting bit is, as you saw in the video there, that by moving to incredibly lightweight equipment and by not disturbing soil, we can dramatically reduce the weight and also energy requirement of um, farming system, so, so for, for tools. So actually we could continue looking at weed control, continue to do that. And actually weeds grow the most after rain, after irrigation. Mm. And that was the real reason why moving to this lightweight platform was so important. For us. Isn't it very slow though? Yeah. So that's the other thing is, as you saw in those videos, they were stop starting. And the reason there was, and uh, the beauty of when you, get to start up as a startup business like this and you bring people from different fields is you know everything on a farm is continuous moving you know you see your tractor drives up and down the field well, the real reason for that is there's a person sat on a seat and that's the way that we're sort of looking at it the weed density is not uniform across a field mm. so what we worked out was is that yes we could move continuously but that would require huge extra capacity 
or alternatively miss weeds. And our idea is to hit, we can hit, identify down to a one millimeter weed and be able to hit it. And the idea is the smaller the weed, the less energy it requires uh, to kill it. So therefore that's when we want to be hitting those weeds and which is what we can achieve. The other bit was then keeping the cost down to something which was cheaper than mechanical. We can't get down to chemical costs yet, but then I would argue if you looked at the full cost of applying a herbicide, either the other environmental packs, the greenhouse gas emissions of applying those those products with a, I mean, a sprayer is 50 times heavier and obviously is diesel powered compared to our solar and electric solution. So, you know, you have to look at a full cost and we, that's where we're obviously aiming with our technology as we scale it to then be able to you know, bring that down and make it a realistic alternative. Fantastic. Which I feel like your robot is zapping me at the moment, actually. <laughs> <laughs> feel like a weed. Um, so, and um, just talking about how you, you've meant, you've insinuated there that you're quite used to rocking the boat and asking questions and sort of being seen as a bit of a maverick and doing things differently. How far off do you think we are? You know, if you were to walk into the Brassica Growers Conference and a lot of conventional growers, how far off do you think we are from convincing them that embracing this kind of robotic technology is going to become the norm? Or are you still seen as the maverick? No, no not at all. I mean, I was talking to big conventional lettuce growers. They've lost their post-emergence herbicides. They don't have any available, so they're looking at solutions. Yet the regulation's actually moving faster than we can innovate in the ag chem space for veg and salad crops. So those who aren't going to adopt it aren't going to survive because you're simply not going to be able to do it. So it's, yeah. it's not a either or. And I think the other bit is that this isn't a replacement for what other people are currently doing on the farm. I mean, hand labour is a real problem. We simply mm. do not have enough people to do those jobs. Yeah. So, yeah, if I continue using a model organically, I mean this was our big problem that you know we've had to reduce our veg area because we could not get enough people to harvest our crop and obviously growing a crop and not harvesting it is absolute financial suicide because mm -hmm. you've had all the cost and no income so that's the backdrop which we're doing but then if you look to kind of like Mexico bank glyphosate you know the EU's policy of reducing 50 percent uh, chemicals you know the, the regulate the regulatory direction is away from herbicides. Mm, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. So I had a great question, but I want to get on to the other two. I might come back to you if we have time. Um, so uh, next up, uh, Jack. Um, so moving on to drone technology. So Jack is director of Drone Ag at Skippy Scout. Um, you're upskilling farmers um, and land managers so they can operate drones themselves. Can you just talk us through how you do that? Because my dad is a 71-year-old sheep farmer, and the thought of him operating a drone is frankly terrifying. So um, how, how are you bringing that skill to farmers and growers? I mean, yeah, actually, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there. It's, for us, it's about how we can make this technology work for farmers now, not in five or ten years' time and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, and, you know, we farm up in Northumberland ourselves, so we, we knew right from early on that if we were going to go down the route of putting a drone in the hands of a farmer or agronomist that it needed to be extremely easy to use. Yeah. And the way to do that is through automation. So uh, very much like where farming is going in general, but on a much more specific note, how can we make a drone fly around a field all by itself and collect the imagery and data we want that's going to be useful to the farmer at the end of it all? Um, well, so no one's actually there at the edge of the field flying? So right now, regulations, you need to be at the edge of the field, but the drone itself actually flies to the points in the field, gathers the information, gathers the high-level overview, um, like you see on the screen, um, completely automatically. So we're not relying on the farmer to, to, to fly the drone or even to understand how the data that's collected is interpreted, interpreted or delivered. That's all done through a fully automated pipeline. The farmer's there to monitor the drone, um, generally, they'll be walking the field a little bit at the same time, but the drone can obviously collect a lot more data a lot faster than they'd be able to walk that field. Um, that data is then all uploaded, it's all processed, it's all analysed and delivered in a PDF field report to the farmer within a few minutes after the flight. And that PDF, again, that's designed to tell a farmer or agronomist the information they need to know to make a decision. Wow. So we're interpreting the data in a way that they can understand. We're not trying to make decisions for them. We're just saying, right, okay, this field right now, it's all seed rape, it's a 30% flowering fraction. So you need to think about spray timing. Or, you know, 
this field of barley in that bottom left corner, the ears are just starting to emerge. So again, spray timings, what you're going to do. Or this field has 50% weed cover, it really needs a spray. Or it's only 5% weed cover overall, or it's 5% weed cover in part of the field, therefore think about maybe only spraying part of the field, or it's low enough that you don't need to worry about spraying. Wow. So it's all about just providing data very, very quickly, but data they can understand and use. How often are they out there with this drone? Like how often would you um, use it? it? It, it varies a lot from farmer to farmer. It's very much based on how they normally do their field walking and that right. kind of thing. Um, you know, right now, again, we're not trying to change the way, you know, people work or what they do. We, we want this to fit in with their current workflows and activities. So, you know, there are times of the year, you know, early spring when farmers or agronomists are doing a lot of field walking, so they'll be using the drone a lot. Other times of the year, like the middle of winter, well, they'll be off skiing or shooting probably. So <laughs> um, there's not much going on at all. Um, so it, it varies completely, but it's very much fits into how people work now. It just, it's designed to make that a lot more efficient and a lot more effective in the data they're getting back. Do they need a pilot's license, a drone pilot license? Um, so again, because one of our biggest challenges was taking off the shelf drones and making them work for us, rather than having to use customer or expensive drone systems. Um, so we use, you know, all, all our systems use small off the shelf drones that are very cheap. Um, because they're small and light, um, the regulation is pretty easy on them. You need to register them online. Um, do a very quick online course, but it takes you know a matter of minutes, costs about five quid. Um, and then a farmer can operate on their own land. Wow. If it's an agronomist and they're providing it as a service to others, they do need a, a commercial license to operate the drone. But again, you know, it's, it's, it's a two-day course to do that. Mm -hmm. It's generally done online. It's less than a thousand pounds. Agronomists are generally used to having to get certifications, qualifications. So again, it's not a massive barrier to entry in that way anymore. Can you only fly it on a dry, still day? Uh, no, not so much. Um, we, we, we obviously test these things a lot on our own farm, right to the limit. Um, we have had them flying in 30 mile an hour winds when it's raining and the drone survived. Probably wouldn't recommend you do that all the time, um, but it's the kind of thing that you can use a lot more than you consider. Um, so we don't generally find that too much of a restricting factor either. How many farmers have crashed their drones? Um, Again, we've, we've worked really hard to make sure the technology is safe. So it's the, our whole system, when, when a boundary is imported for a field, our system builds a whole 3D model of that field. It pulls in information about power lines, about trees, about airspace, all that kind of stuff. And it will only let the drone fly if it's safe. And it will only fly the drone through a safe flight path, um, which means that I would say 98% of the time we don't have an issue. And that 2% of the time, generally we have the issue when we're testing before it gets to anyone else. So. How many times have we crashed a drone? A lot. How many times have farmers and the clients crashed a drone? A very, very small amount, yeah, amazing. I would say. Fantastic. That, that's fascinating. Well, we'll be opening up to questions in a minute. I'd um, just like to move on to Jim. Um, so one of the most exciting areas in farming at the moment is soil health because we're, we're learning so much all the time and how technology can help us unlock vital data about a largely unexplored world beneath our feet. Um, you're managing director at Soil Essentials, and it's all very well having that data, but understanding it is another thing. How are you helping farmers understand what we're discovering about our soils? Yes, thanks, Anna. Um, well, I suppose we are a bit, well, a bit different in that we are a, a long-established technology company. We started in 2000, based, you know, started by farmers in 2000. Even then, we, we as farmers recognise the importance of soil, the clues in the name, soil essentials, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's from, from the late 90s, early 2000s. Now, um, it's really hard to, be, to generalise about anything, anything in agriculture. Everything is site-specific. Everything changes according to the weather, to the crops, uh, to the soil that, that's there, and the markets. The markets drive everything, let's face it. So let's look at soil. I mean, so soil is not just soil. Soil is, a, is usually broken up into three factors. You know, the, the, soil physic, the, the soil physics, the chemistry, and the biology. And to deal with such a diverse range of, of tools, and of course, it's soil. So it's, it's soil is, is a very diverse substance. But the, the crops you grow uh, on them are also very diverse, which are affected by the soil. And of course, everything is overridden by the weather. So you're dealing with that unholy trinity, if you like, of, of all that variability stacked together. So our approach has always been to have a range of tools because no one tool, uh, no one precision ag tool is correct in all places at all time. So I feel my job as a farmer is to, is to use the correct tools in the correct time in the correct place 
um, and uh, to get the best output. Um, and our job as a technology company is to try and, and develop and supply and support tools that are a, uh, a range of tools that, are, that can be uh, that the, the, the users can pick and choose from that best suit their particular circumstances. So on, on that side then, if we drill into the, the soil chemistry, if you like, so the soil chemistry, we started off in the late 90s looking at the variability of soil chemistry. Look, I'm from Scotland, and Scotland is, uh, um, has got lots of differences, obviously. One of the major ones is the, that they were coming from an, an acid soil base. You know, our, our soils are very acid. So uh, the, we started taking four samples per hectare for pH, just pH, nothing else, not P, not K, uh, just to try and, uh, and sort that basic pH uh, problem out. That's been very successful. We've, we've moved, moved that on. Um, but the rules for, t for sampling for soil pH only, which is a key component of soil health, are completely different in Scotland as they are in England as they are in Holland. Uh, but they're also, the, those rules are also completely different for phosphate and potassium, magnesium, calcium, all the rest. One size does not fit all in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So I get very annoyed when, I, when people take one soil sample, or one a hectare, or whatever it is, that, that, uh, that is all treated the same. I don't think they understand the inherent variability and the underlying, underlying rules behind that. So chemistry is, is a really uh, key but very uh, under appreciated, perhaps, uh, part of, of farming well. Uh, we always joke that if you can get the, the soil pH right and the drainage right, then you're halfway to, to, to farming properly. Second, soil biology. I mean, soil biology is an absolutely key part. Obviously, much un unappreciated, of course. Mm. Um, and and we're, I, I feel we've, we've done many projects funded by Innovate UK, funded by H2020, uh, ESA was another one, where we do look right. at uh, we, do, we have looked intensively at soil biology across the whole of the UK. Mm. Um, we've still, I still feel we've only just got st scratching the surface of that, that, that part of it. Um, soil physics, uh, it, it's a, probably a slightly easier thing to deal with nowadays because the soil physics, as in percent sand, soil clay, uh, and uh, compaction tend not to change. Okay, compaction you can, you can map and measure, but soil physics tends not to change. And there are many good tools out there that actually you can use to, to measure soil texture. The key thing is then is how do you lump all that together? How do you put all that data together in, into one, one tool that, that meets the needs of growers and, uh, and advisors, but also gives the uh, recommendations or gives information that you can use to make management decisions? That's the missing part. Um, and, to skip over a lot of the detail, what we've been doing now over the last uh, two or three years is to run large-scale uh, watershed area, so carbon, nitrogen, and what and hydrological models to predict the change, the change, not the absolute value, but the change in soil carbon, soil nitrogen, and, and water and hydrological water <coughs> capacity. Um, we find it really difficult to uh, to predict what the soil carbon is at each spot in the field, but we are we are making maps of this, the change in, in soil carbon and nitrogen across that time over a whole rotation. So the, we feel that with the move towards, um, you know, I think somebody mentioned that that they started selling soil carbon. One of the key things is that you, you know the recommendations is you can take soil carbon samples every five years. Well, you can go an awful, you can go very wrong in five years. Mm. So our aim is to is to give daily, weekly, monthly updates as to where you're moving o over the whole rotation, <coughs> uh, frequent updates to, to actually show which path you're on, and and make suggestions about how you can uh, improve that path. Fantastic. Um, I ask you a million questions about that, but I do want to open up to questions. Um, just before I do, um, from the previous session, but it's also highly relevant to you guys, um, an absolutely banging question came from Rose at Harper Adams University, who uh, came over to me and said, you know, there are an awful lot of farmers out there that want to embrace 
some of these innovations. But the idea of having agritech on the farm could be can be quite an overwhelming or an intimidating idea. Um, I'd just like to ask you and also bring in some of the farmers from the panel session before about what if you've never embraced any kind of technological solution apart from maybe a tractor or something on the farm, where would you start? What's the kind of entry level agri-tech way to start thinking about using innovation in your business? Um, do, do any, anyone want to sort of think, yeah? I'll, I'll just reiterate what I've said before. Yeah, yeah. Find the problem that, that you have that you can solve. Find the low hanging fruit. Find the thing that's costing you money uh, 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 and, and, and fix that problem. Yes. And if you do that, yep. then you've got one step up. And yeah. then find the next one and fix that. And, and so on yeah. and go. Yeah. We'll have one simple success yeah. and uh, it'll go very easily. And for us, the simple success was first, so pH mapping, not sexy, not clever, but just agronomically and business, uh, from a business point of view, sensible. And then the next step was of steering tractors it makes people's lives better yeah. and saves money. Yeah, and I think, um, and that's it, isn't it? It's like there's a lot, could be a bit of peer pressure that you've got to go for something sexy like a robot, but you don't have to go straight in for a robot. You can, and, and just before, um, Sophie, I can't see because I'm a weed being zapped by a, um, where's Sophie and, and Joe? Yeah, you were talking about something really important from a farmer perspective with this. Golly, was I? Yeah, um, about um, <laughs> how do I actually log, log on? <laughs> Um, user friendliness of digital, um, what we call high tech technology, is key. And actually, just since I've been, you know, fortunate enough to work with AgriEpi, the user friendliness of the stuff has improved a lot. Um, and I suppose I can only say, just find someone younger in the farming business. <laughs> you know, my generation, we're not going to be around much longer anyway. It's going to be much easier to sell high. You're, you're not to old. The <laughs> to the next generation. I'm, I'm the average age of a farmer. Um, but, you know, the next generation are going to embrace it so much more easily because mm. it is a hard language to learn and I get very frustrated with it and it's time consuming. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, you're doing other things. So it has to add value. As you said, it really has to add value to want to engage in it. Yeah, you need to have that. Joe, you were saying, you're, you're 39, and you said you were made to feel like you were old in one group. No, sorry. I'm older, don't worry. Sorry, sorry. You offered it so freely. I was like... I did have... I had my Skippy Scout training a little while ago, thinking that I would have John alongside for solidarity. He, he jibbed and passed it on to his son. So I was I suddenly realised I was the oldest person in the room. Um, so the sort of tutting and, and, and scoffing at, at my phone cover and my abilities was, was high. Uh, and yeah, just you, the, the, the backup is what I'm going to say about, you know, we do actually have quite a bit of tech and we're quite good at using what we've got. Mm. If we don't see a point of it, we won't get good at yeah. using it. Um, that value thing again. Yeah. Having tech support for when we can't get something to work, like our, our AgriWeb, we can only do livestock movements off that off of a phone version, not off a main computer version, yeah. which doesn't seem to make any sense, but that is the way it is. So, have, But we didn't know that, so we spend hours trying to make it work. It doesn't. We give up and go away. Um, and if we've got somebody easily we can contact that can help us and say, oh, no, it doesn't do that. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, I'm going to take those points about user friendliness, backup and support. And also, that's a really important point about feeling scoffed at and feeling like, oh, you've got an old NAF phone case and you're a granny case, a granny case. A granny case. you know, you're not quite as switched on as us digital natives. I mean, that, that's got to be a barrier to take up, hasn't it? Um, Jack? Yeah, I think I think it is. Um, I think one of one of the key things we've done in terms of the sports side of things is um, well, we've employed people that have a farming background. Almost first and foremost, we can teach them the rest. Mm -hmm. Generally, young guys that want to learn about tech and that kind of thing, but guys that have a farming background, so they can talk farmer. So they can immediately identify with the person they're talking to and help them solve the issue. Because you're completely right, we can try and make the technology as easy to use as possible, but um, you know, if, if, if it's someone that doesn't have even much experience with a smartphone or something like that, then they really need to be taken through step by step. So we need patient people that understand farming as well. Yeah. 
um, and not just understand farming so that you can talk to that person in the right kind of way, but also understand that actually you might have to talk to them at eight o'clock in the evening because they're going to be busy during the day and that kind of thing really helps as well. So it's just kind of stuff like that that comes into the mix. And I think, I think the way we'd like to go with this and the, the way I think about all technology is the best technology implementation, you almost don't even realize it's there. Um, it just happens in the background. And again, coming back to the automation point of view from our side of things, that's the way we'd like to see it go. We're not there yet. But if that technology can just happen seamlessly in the background and let farmers get on with farming, then then we're going to be where we want to be. Yeah, absolutely. Any, any other points on, on that? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just, to just go to James and then we'll come to you, Howard. Can I just challenge the age bit? Because from our experience with my farming hat on, um, actually our slightly older tractor drivers who didn't know exactly how to do it and therefore listened to how to do it rather than thinking they knew how to do it. He and I were chatting about this earlier that, you know, um, you know, that actually they're far better and actually follow the rules. And the whole bit of when you're trying to capture data and trying to uh, get systems to talk to each other, people following rules is a really, really important mm. part of it. And when they don't... It, goes horribly wrong. Um, d just to explain um, uh, on something which is probably a bit more novel than what we're doing, like our robotic system, it will be as a service type is, is the way w which we envisage this being rolled out. So for the first year, it will be very hands-on with people on the farm deploying it as a service to then move into a sale of the product and them running it themselves because we understand that people aren't going to just adopt this they're not going to come out of the box press go on the farm mm. and work first time <coughs> but you're going to need a lot of support uh, it's a challenge from a business model because as soon as you put lots of people on there it doesn't stack up but actually you've got to make that investment and yeah. that's how we see it going into it with your eyes open about the reality of it uh, howard uh, yeah, I I think Jim's just uh, talking about. I was about to say, <laughs> echo is that. I think at the beginning, the robotics probably will be as like a service. Mm -hmm. So we will send our team members out to help the growers and the farmers to use it, uh, because it I. I think it will take some time to do that transition. Uh, I guess the other thing I learned in the past three years is really to have your as a tech people to really have your ears open, your eyes open, to really to listen to the growers and the farmers, to understand their pain points, to understand their priority, to understand what they would like to operate. So uh, we we are very fortunate. We, uh, from early on, we worked with Agri-API, mm -hmm. and their knowledge has really helped us. Uh, myself, I have no farming experience at all. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm trained as an engineer, uh, electronics and software. Uh, but uh, in the past three years, I feel I learned more than the past 30 years about <laughs> the farming. And I feel so fortunate. And so many uh, good uh, farming partners, they are so nice and just uh, talk me through the whole thing. I just, oh yes, I understand why. So I think it's really to listen to the growers, listen to the farmers, and work with them, not to develop by ourselves to develop in the collaboration, in the partnership. For example, I speak a lot with uh, Ian, and we went to his wine yard to do lots of tests. I think all of this really helped us to understand how the business, I mean, farming business operate and where they need the technology to support. Did you ever imagine that you would be working in the agriculture sector? Not until like oh, four years ago. <laughs> I spent about uh, 20 years in automotive industry and developing the controls and the software for the, for the cars. Yeah. <laughs> Which do you prefer, farming or automotive? I would <laughs> say farming. <laughs> 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 so so my, my dream is going to have a piece of farm to work with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, is there any questions before? Yes, sir. Uh, do you find, especially on the, the control and accuracy, do you find that the signal correction services from whoever provides it is good enough currently? And if, if not, how accurate do you need a, 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 a GPS guidance system to give you the spot on mm. location? That's uh, a very good question. Go to you next, 
Sorry, yeah, you go first. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would say it's probably not as good as we would hope for. Right. There are not only about the accuracy, but also about the reliability. Because you may get some area, you have very good synchros, you have very high accuracy. We are talking about one to two centimeter level accuracy, but it's not consistent. And especially when we operate in the horticulture sector, when you get into like a polyethylo or glass house, you will completely lose the GPS. <coughs> so what, uh, uh, what we are doing now is we develop the autonomous driving technology based on vision and other sensors. So for example, when we're outside in the open space, we can use the GPS to help us to navigate. But if we go to into the polytile, like the strawberry rose, we can switch to vision, purely vision and other sensors technologies. We, we don't need the GPS at all, and we can still achieve very high accuracy. So go back to your question, I think it's not, uh, as good as we would uh, hope for, hence we needed to develop some alternative navigation method to make it work, both in open space and in GPS single delayed area. James, you wanted to comment yeah, on that? Very similar to how, I mean, we're obviously all field-based, so not indoors. Um, reliably, at two centimeters, but that's having created a network across the farm. We learned that putting receivers on the top of wind turbines isn't as clever an idea as we thought it was. Um, we thought, oh, that's a nice high, where's the highest point on the farm? Our wind turbine, that'll, that'll help us, but no. Um, so what we then had to do is, because as you saw, we create a unique plant map. So every plant is given its own location. So we've had to be able to develop it down to two centimeters because we know that a plant in the brassica and salad won't be closer than two centimeters apart. So we can do that. So yeah, it's, like I said, the reliability is problematic and it therefore means you have to install a lot of extra infrastructure, which we've done on our test farms, which ideally going forward we wouldn't want to do, but in the short term whilst we're developing, it, it is possible to achieve. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here, sticking with our, t I'm not going to go more than a 10 minute overrun, so we've got to keep this to a couple of minutes. Uh, it's the lady Patricia, here. Patricia, which of the best producer information? I have two questions. The first one is what has especially linking uh, you know, the youth into farming. Yeah. Because you can't talk about sustainability without talking about sustainable future, which will involve the youth and making agriculture attractive mm. to the youth. Um, my question is, how do we intend to attract the youth mm. into agriculture? At the moment, the majority of the youth are not interested in agriculture. Um, the second question is the technology I've seen from uh, Howard and uh, James. James. Yeah. Um, what's the speed? Because it, it looks like it's very slow speed. So how long will it take to map out, let's say, one hectare? And uh, with the way it works, does it can it do a hill, you know, not smooth field? Like, okay. Uh, you know, where there is mountains and Thanks, Patricia. Let's take the, the quick question first. So how long will it take a robot to map a hectare? Let's just get a quick answer on that. So we're killing up to 60 weeds a second. So it depends on how many weeds you've got as to how fast we go forward. Um, but the idea is it's lots of little lightweight vehicles. So rather than in, historically agriculture has got bigger and bigger and bigger, <coughs> now going for a swarm approach, which is a completely different thought process. So it's not how quick one can do it, it's what's the cost of doing it across. Excellent. Have you got any? Yep. Uh, and uh, the question on attracting the youth into agriculture, and could this digital innovation help with that? Um, does anyone have a, 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 any thoughts on attracting young people into the sector? Um, I can go from a bit of experience um, in that I was never interested in farming when I was younger, even though I'm from a farming family. Um, very much a geek, very much into tech and all that kind of stuff, probably hence where I'm at now. But um, the reason I got interested in farming again is because I hate living, living in a city and decided to move back to the family farm. Mm, interesting. And yeah. immediately thought, right, what can I apply what I've learned in, well, at the time it was web design and, and drone filming into the farm. And that, that was my routine. And I think that kind of route into farming is potentially a very good route to go. Yeah. And what we do now is we're, we're constantly looking for interns and people interested 
to come up to us. We're in Northumberland, so generally it's from that kind of area, but we're always interested in people and we're always talking to universities about various different things. But lots of universities have lots of big agricultural departments now and that kind of thing. So it's really about the tech companies, I think, saying to these universities, anyone's welcome, come work for us and, and going from there. That's a great answer. I'm, I'm a farm kid myself and I never would have left if the work was there. I had to leave, I had to go to the city because there's no work. Um, so maybe it's about bringing these industries back into rural areas, as long as we've got the broadband. Uh, yeah. yeah, with regard to the question about attracting youth, give them a, a, a good quality, well-paid career progression. Mm -hmm. That's what's missing, and that comes back to the, the, the sustainable farm incomes. You know, allow the farms to be, uh, to be profitable and sustainable, and then we, we, we know, we've heard, we all know on our own farms, that one of the biggest limitations is labour. And... The, the, the reason for that is that for many years, farming was not seen as a high paying job. We need to change that. And uh, just a last thought, James, you got some... Well, the other bit is not talking the industry down, but if, if people are constantly reading and hearing the fact that an industry isn't successful and vibrant, mm. people don't want to enter it. So, mm. you know, the more times people moan, oh, the price is too low, or that's not an attractive way to get people in. It's got to be, there is lots of excitement there. There is lots of opportunity. And um, I think it's promoting that. Yeah, that's great. Howard, have you got any thoughts on, um, especially coming from a non-farming background, you know, your thoughts on joining the sector? Uh, yeah, so, so maybe at the very beginning, I, I'm a bit naive and, uh, and, uh, and brave, thinking, oh, this might be an easy job to do farming. But after the three years, I realized that uh, uh, automotive is complicated, it's, uh, it's uh, hard uh, to really make it right. But after three years experience, I would say farming is harder. <laughs> wow. Is that because it's just more variable? More variables. Yeah. And uh, more things that you need to uh, cope with and also the huge uncertainty. Yeah. Because we cannot, the biggest uncertainty is uh, weather. Yes. And, uh, and also like our uh, mother planet Earth, because yeah. there are so many things happening. Anything like the chemicals, anything like the climate change that can impact, and which is war probably out of our control. We try to, for example, we try to make uh, everything more environment friendly. Mm -hmm. we, we try to be carbon neutral to counteract climate change. But those like big things really make, I think, farming is more complicated. Mm -hmm. In terms of attract, I think uh, the, 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 the young generations get into, I think these are the right challenges. These are the right challenges to challenge the young minds and also to attract them into this sector. Mm -hmm. uh, I have my colleague here, uh, Colin. Uh, uh, yeah, he uh, graduated uh, uh, two years ago and uh, he trained as an uh, uh, engineer, but uh, he joined us because uh, he also felt, yeah, this is something very interesting. We are doing something uh, interesting and useful, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, we, we got uh, in our team, we have 13 team members in the UK. I would say uh, I'm almost the oldest one, and uh, our average edge is probably under 30. So we've got lots of like young, so we are attracting, young yeah. minds in, in the team. I, 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 I say the technology there is a good way to get the young minds into this, this sector and mm. make this se sector more dynamic. Yeah. Uh, and in the meantime, as a business, uh, I'm also looking very much for your help and support. As a startup, startup is also a hard work. So we need your support and help to keep us going. And so together, we can build something amazing and help the farming help the environment and economically and, and socially help the rural community. Fantastic. Thank, I'm going to have to wrap up there. If you had your hand up, I'm so sorry. I can't see anything. Um, so um, I just want to thank what our fantastic panel here, which just really got some interesting conversations going. I thought the answer to yours question, Patricia, was great. And it's, it's really it's heartwarming to know that the sheer fact that there's so much challenge out there for an engineering mind is what is attracting the young people. So um, let's hope that continues. Um, so please just show our appreciation to fantastic panel.